The topics in this unit include imaging parameters for placental localization, risk factors and sonographic diagnosis of placenta previa and low-lying placenta, and risk factors for placenta accreta. Normal placental characteristics show a thickened echogenic rim at 10 weeks gestation. After 18 weeks there is a homogeneous placental mass and normal central cord insertion. A hypoechoic area is present in the retroplacental space and the placental mid-area measures 2 to 4 cm. This image demonstrates a sagittal view of a normal posterior placenta at 20 weeks. This image demonstrates the normal placenta in the right lateral transverse plane at 20 and 5 7 weeks. In this normal placental image taken at 25 weeks, the position is posterior, and the placenta is fundal. In this sagittal plane taken at 22 weeks, the normal posterior placenta is associated with a uterine contraction. This image displays the anatomy of the uterus and how it relates to the front edge of the placenta. The ICO, the internal cervical os, is the opening to the uterus, as opposed to the external cervical os, located in the vagina. Placenta previa is a condition where the placenta is implanted abnormally, with any part covering or being close to the internal cervical os. Placenta previa is where a portion of the placenta covers the internal cervical os completely or is within 2 cm of it partially. The position of the placenta's leading edge concerning the internal cervical os can be determined using either transabdominal or transvaginal ultrasound, depending on the situation. When scanning the placenta transabdominally, begin with the transducer in the sagittal plane and scan from right to left, superiorly and inferiorly. It's important to pay attention to the relationship of the placenta leading it in the lower uterine segment to the internal cervical os. If the fetus obstructs the view of the lower uterine segment, scanning laterally may be necessary. By 20 weeks, it is recommended to use a transabdominal ultrasound probe to image the lower uterine segment, the placenta, and internal cervical os. A sagittal view can be used to obtain images of the lower uterine segment, and its relationship to the placental tissue and to show the internal cervical os. If the relationship between the placental edge and internal os is unclear, a transvaginal ultrasound should be performed. In cases where fluid or clot is present near the internal os, a transvaginal ultrasound may also be necessary. This image shows a sagittal view of a transabdominal ultrasound, where the placenta extends to near the internal cervical opening. The ultrasound reveals a mixture of bright and dark areas, indicating the presence of fluid or blood clots. This matches the patient's history. To determine the presence of placenta previa, a transvaginal ultrasound should be performed with the probe activated at the start of the exam. It's possible to obtain complete information without touching the cervix. The image should show the internal and external cervical os, the endocervical canal, and measure the cervical length. Additionally, Measurements should be taken between the leading edge of the placenta and the internal cervical os while identifying the placenta and its margin in the midline sagittal plane. In summary, when examining the cervix with transvaginal ultrasound, it is important to note the internal and external cervical os and canal. The measurements of the cervical length and the distance between the placental margin and the internal cervical os should be taken in centimeters. To determine the relationship between the leading edge of the placenta and the internal cervical os, transvaginal ultrasound is used to measure the distance between them. There are three possible outcomes, 1. Complete placenta previa, where the placenta covers the internal cervical os. 2. Incomplete placenta previa, where the leading edge of the placenta is within 2 cm of the internal os, and 3. Low-line placenta, where the placenta is more than 2 cm away from the internal cervical os but located in the lower third of the uterus. It's important to report any consistent echoes of blood, free fluid, or clots found during an examination. Patients with a prior C-section or uterine scar should be assessed for placenta accreta, including multiple lacunae, a hypoechoic line between the placenta and bladder, and subplacental zones. A velamentous cord insertion and accessory placental lobes may increase the risk of a fetal vessel crossing the internal cervical os, basa previa. Here is a diagram of the uterus with complete placenta previa. It shows the important connections between the internal cervical os, the cervix, and the placenta. You can also see the cervical canal and the external cervical os. Note that the placenta only partially covers the internal cervical os and is located within 2 cm from the internal os. However, it does not fully obstruct the internal cervical opening.
The risk factors for placenta previa are divided into historical and present pregnancy. Historical risk factors include previous C-sections, termination of pregnancy, higher parity, and advanced maternal age. Pregnancies involving assisted reproduction, smoking, and multifetal gestation have been found to present risks of placenta previa in the current or present pregnancy. Research shows that the risk of placenta previa is almost three times higher in pregnancies that involve assisted reproduction. Furthermore, the rate of placenta previa is 40% higher in twins than in singletons. During pregnancy, the front edge of the placenta may move away from the lower part of the uterus and the internal cervical opening. This movement can be complicated and difficult to understand. Studies using ultrasound have revealed that about 15% of women have a low-lying placenta at 12 to 14 weeks gestation. Still, in 85% of these cases, the placenta returns to a normal position by term. However, if a complete placenta previa is present at 30 weeks gestation, there is a 75% chance that it will persist until delivery. To summarize, a complete placenta previa or posterior placenta previa within 1 cm of the internal cervical os increases the likelihood of a term placenta previa. In addition, if the final placental distance is less than 2.0 cm, it may lead to complications during delivery and require a C-section. It can be difficult to identify placenta previa due to certain factors. These include the inability to differentiate the lower uterine segment and difficulty defining the internal cervical os. The fetal position can sometimes obscure a posterior low-lying placenta or posterior placenta previa, particularly if the fetal head is positioned in the lower uterus. Additionally, uterine contractions and a full maternal bladder can sometimes lead to a false positive diagnosis. These two diagrams illustrate the impact of excessive filling of the mother's bladder on the likelihood of posterior placenta previa. When the bladder is overloaded, the lower part of the uterus shifts, and there is no indication of placenta previa. If the mother's bladder is decompressed, there could be a chance of having a posterior placenta previa. In such cases, it is necessary to undergo transvaginal ultrasound. On a transabdominal ultrasound at 24 weeks and 4 days, the sagittal plane shows how the leading edge of the placenta is positioned in relation to the internal cervical opening. During a 20-week transabdominal ultrasound, the sagittal plane reveals the presence of placental tissue near the internal os. It's important to note the external cervical os is located at the proximal end of the vagina. Additionally, there is a lower uterine segment contraction present. This image follows the previous 20-week ultrasound. The uterine contraction is no longer visible, and there is a clearer distinction between the placental margin and the internal os. The umbilical cord is located in the lower uterine segment, but there is no sign of the umbilical vessel crossing near the internal os. A transvaginal ultrasound is recommended. However, the placenta margin will likely regress by term at this stage of pregnancy. During a 20-week and 3-day transabdominal ultrasound, the sagittal plane shows that the placental margin is close to the internal os. Additionally, there is a mixed echogenic pattern in the lower uterine segment, likely due to fluid or clot and consistent with maternal bleeding. During a 20-week and 5-day transabdominal ultrasound, the placenta is located near the internal os and the sagittal plane. However, the precise relationship between the placental margin and internal os remains unknown, and thus, a transvaginal ultrasound is recommended for further investigation. Here is an ultrasound at 20 and 5 7 weeks using a transvaginal view. The cervical os and placenta margin are clearly visible, enabling accurate measurement between the placental edge and the internal os. The measurement of 2.1 cm at this stage of pregnancy is reassuring but a follow-up ultrasound around 28 to 30 weeks is recommended. Based on the sagittal view of the transvaginal ultrasound, there is a distance of 1.35 cm between the internal os and placental margin. This indicates that there may be an incomplete placenta previa or marginal placenta previa, and further clinical and ultrasound follow-up is recommended. Based on a sagittal view of transvaginal ultrasound, the margin of the placenta covers the internal os completely. This finding may not regress if the gestational age is advanced, ranging from 28 to 30 weeks. However, if the gestational age is earlier, regression is possible. It is recommended to have a follow-up clinical or transvaginal ultrasound to monitor the situation.
The ultrasound shows a sagittal view of the placental margin that completely covers the internal cervical os. This discovery is not likely to improve with the progression of pregnancy. Therefore, close clinical and ultrasound monitoring is necessary. This condition is known as complete placenta previa. The ultrasound shows a complete placenta previa with the placenta covering the internal cervical os in the sagittal view. During a transvaginal ultrasound, a sagittal view showed that a part of the placenta covers the internal os. There is also an anechoic area near this area, but without color Doppler flow, it is impossible to determine whether it is blood, fluid, a clot, or a vascular structure. A sagittal view is taken during a transvaginal ultrasound to clarify the nature of an anechoic area seen on 2D ultrasound. Color Doppler flow is used to identify these structures as vascular and representing placental vessels. These vessels can be the cause of maternal bleeding, which is a potential complication of placenta previa. Placenta accreta is a general term for abnormal placental attachments. The term denotes a spectrum of attachment disorders, usually defined as placenta accreta, placenta increta, and placenta percreta. The more current terminology for these disorders is the morbidly adherent placenta. Caesarean scar pregnancy, CSP, is a term related to the morbidly adherent placenta. During the first trimester of pregnancy, an ultrasound can differentiate between a CSP and a normal intrauterine pregnancy based on the location of the gestational sac center in relation to the uterus's midpoint axis. A caesarean scar pregnancy and early placenta accreta are histologically indistinguishable, and a CSP can lead to a morbidly adherent placenta. These diagrams demonstrate various levels of morbidly adherent placenta, also known as placenta accreta or placenta accreta vera. In this example, the placenta abnormally attaches to the myometrium and invades the decidua basalis. In morbidly adherent placenta or placenta increta, the placenta grows into the uterine wall or the myometrium. In morbidly adherent placenta or placenta percreta, the placenta invades the uterine wall and reaches the surface of the uterus. It may also infiltrate the side walls of the uterus, parametrium, or even the maternal bladder. In summary, when the placenta is located low in the uterus or covers the cervix, placenta previa, it may attach to a previous C-section scar. This can lead to the placenta invading the muscle layer of the uterus, myometrium, which can cause severe bleeding during childbirth. The bleeding occurs because the placenta does not detach completely from the uterine wall. After a hysterectomy, a cut section of the uterus shows placental tissue penetrating into the uterine wall, and the placenta remains in place. In this view, the cut surface of the uterus is visible, revealing the placenta penetrating into the uterine wall. The placental tissue and membranes are attached to sections of the uterine muscle. Upon microscopic examination of the uterine specimen, the chorionic villi, placental tissue, has invaded the myometrium. In this microscopic examination of the uterine specimen, note the relationship of the chorionic villi to the uterine muscle, myometrium. Recent studies show that the morbidly adherent placenta occurs in about half a percent to almost 1% of pregnancies. This incidence is increasing due to the rise in C-sections and is a significant issue in modern obstetrics. Patients with morbidly adherent placenta typically exhibit one or more risk factors, the most significant being placenta previa and C-sections. There are several other risk factors to consider, such as having multiple previous pregnancies, undergoing previous curatage procedures, a history of myomectomy or endometrial ablation, hysteroscopy lysis of adhesions, and termination of pregnancy. When a woman has had previous caesarean sections and anterior placenta previa, there is a higher likelihood of experiencing placenta accreta or morbidly adherent placenta. Additionally, for patients with placenta previa, there is a strong connection between the number of previous caesarean deliveries, the occurrence of placenta accreta, and the need for peripartum hysterectomy. The morbidly adherent placenta or placenta accreta is typically linked with a prior caesarean birth around 78% of the time while it is associated with placenta previa approximately 88% of the time. Furthermore, the risk of placenta accreta is higher in patients who have complete placenta previa, 
even after taking other factors into account. In summary, the chances of having a morbidly adherent placenta depend on the history of C-sections. If a patient had both a previous C-section and placenta previa, then there is a 37% probability of exhibiting some form of adherent placenta. However, if a patient only has placenta previa and no previous C-section, then the likelihood of having an adherent placenta is low, at only 1.1%. This concludes the section on ultrasound of the placenta in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. The next unit will review twin gestations.